Hello and welcome to Money Matters this week. Coming up on the show, starting a home-based bakery, the crucial tips, the hurdles against the effort to commercialize Uganda's oil resources and the story of an ICT entrepreneur seeking to revolutionize the education system. Effecting projects of a long-term nature requires long-term financing and this may not easily happen with commercial banks because of the short-term nature of their funds. Development banks like Uganda Development Bank are always the sources of long-term development finance. This week we speak to Patricia Oljangole, the CEO of Uganda Development Bank, on this issue. All right, Patricia, it's very nice to have you on the show. Money Matters, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, you lead a development bank, yes. the Uganda Development Bank. Yes. Uh, yes. For a number of our viewers, of course, many may not know what the bank is, what it does. Just break it down for us. What do you do as Uganda Development Bank? What is your story? Thank you. Uganda Development Bank is wholly owned by the government of Uganda, yes. where government has 100% shares in the bank. The bank was established in 1972 by the government of Uganda with the objective of providing mid to long term finance to economic projects in the country. And this was meant to spur economic activity in the country. The bank is a non-deposit taking finance institutions. What I mean is we do not have branches like most of the commercial banks are, um, have. The bank operates a head office kind of setting where we do credit and sitting with um, various support functions. We do support projects across the country. So we've got projects in the north, we've got projects in the east, in the west, in the south, mm -hmm. because our mandate covers the entire country. I hear you. Mm -hmm. Now, um, for those who may not know the difference between a development bank and a commercial bank, because if you talk about banks, someone will think about a commercial bank. Help us in specific terms understand the difference between a development bank, like Uganda Development Bank, and the commercial banks that we see every day. Like I mentioned, most of the development banks around the world yes. are owned by the government. Okay. So government set them up okay. to help the government promote economic development. Mm -hmm. Development banking requires um, patient capital, mm -hmm. if I can put it that way. It requires long-term finance. Most of the credit that is available on the market, say, in, for example, in Uganda, short-term finance because it's mainly mobilized through deposits of savers who will want um, a higher return for the investment and probably would want it back faster. Now development projects will not require that kind of capital and that's why the current capital that's available on the market most cases does not match the development needs um, of the development projects. That is the relevance of development banks. Now let's look at the sectors that you've been able to finance as a bank, Uganda Development Bank. What are some of these areas you're looking at? Uganda Development Bank has recently positioned itself, repositioned itself to support government to deliver the theme of its national development plan. Yes. In the country's national development plan, there are key growth sectors that have been identified as the sectors that will bring about the most development impact in the economy. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is need to spur growth in these sectors. Now, in line with that, the sectors that we finance are the key growth sectors that are identified in the national development plan okay. of government. These are agriculture. And talking about agriculture, we look at the entire agriculture value chain, yeah. right from production, productivity, agro-processing, uh, and value addition, mm. storage, distribution, and marketing. The other sector is um, education, hospitality, or tourism, health, uh, real estate and construction, mm. and trade services. Okay, that's very interesting. Now, um, let's look at um, the condition. If I'm a business, and I want to get a loan from Uganda Development Bank. Yes. What do I need to have, just in general terms? You need to come to the bank with a, a clear business concept. Yeah. 
Now, when the bank comes, the bank will have to just look at your um, concepts. Mm -hmm. It has to be in the sectors that we have just talked about. Yes. There has to be development impact that the bank should be able to see in terms of uh, job creation, how many jobs um, uh, are you going to create, mm. what level of uh, local production uh, are you going to, uh, to spur. Mm. Um, in the agriculture sector, we just look at to what extent can we or can the farmers increase their incomes and for improve uh, their standards of living. Very good. Now let's look on the um, you know, side of capitalization. How are you doing as a bank currently and what plans do you have going forward? In terms of capitalization, the shareholders agreed mm -hmm. to increase the authorized share capital of the bank okay. from 100 billion that it was previously mm -hmm. to 500 billion. We are getting close to the initial 100 billion fully paid up. And together with our shareholders government, we are working out um, strategies and modalities of how to increase the, the paid up capital mm -hmm. of the bank. But the actual state of capitalization of the bank at the moment um, is not very adequate, mm -hmm. but we hope and we are sure that in a few years time to come midterm, the 500 billion will be paid up and then the bank will now be comfortable to play in the space that is supposed to play. Nice to talk to you, Patricia. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Thank you. Over now to the oil and gas sector. Now, commercializing Uganda's estimated 6.5 billion barrels of crude oil through issuing of production sharing agreements for two other key farms remains on the table and unsorted. But even as there's near protest over this holdback, government says it is also contesting the proposed extraction rates of some of the oil companies, some as low as 3%. We have more in the following report. Government says it will not bend back to the current pressure by the public over the delayed provision or production licenses to some of the oil farms. What one of the companies for one of the fields had proposed to only extract 3%. I now want to turn a question to you. If you are the owner of the resource and uh, someone tells you I'm only going to extract 3%, would you accept or not? Apart from CINOC, Total and Talo's immediate acquisition of production licenses would consolidate confidence in the sector, says the Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. To hear the day for the production licenses to be given. Because without this, the others coming will really drag their feet. Please sort out the production licenses with the existing oil companies as soon as possible. So the process of production licenses is engagement back and forth. They give us detailed methodology on how they intend to extract that crude and we analyze and agree. But with the estimates of only 1.4 million barrels of crude as recoverable out of a record 6.5 billion barrels, oil farms must be fair. With the enhanced approaches which these uh, uh, engineers term as tertiary extraction it brings in about 10 to 15 percent. So, in a nutshell, primary, secondary, in some, should be able to give us between 35 to 45 percent. So, government has the, has the average figures. So, anybody reporting uh, as low as 30 percent, in a nutshell, is really not being believed. With close to $3.1 billion already injected into the local economy through capital investment by oil exploration farms, wild market trends of crude are barely saving the situation. Investors in the oil industry have an incentive to delay to, or to slow down the investments as they wait to see how global, global prices might move. These concerns come on the backdrop of fears that Russia's Arctic global resources now a preferred bidder for the construction 
of the 2.5 billion oil refinery may face UN sanctions over its military hardware transactions. That's why in the request for proposals, we stated that we shall remain with two bidders. One is number one, one is number two. Then we negotiate with number one. As the minister said, if there are issues, then we go to number two. But also in the negotiations, you have the option of allowing this bidder to improve the bid. So this is a highly modified bidding process, and I think it's a model which everybody in Uganda should adopt. In the refinery deal, the lead investor is set to hold 60% of proceeds out of the multi-trillion shilling investment where government of Uganda has a 40% stake. All too frequently, there have been reports in the media of collapsed buildings caused by poor designs and in addition to bad workmanship and the use of substandard building materials. This state of affairs has not only cost the country lives, but huge amounts of monies. This week on Consumer Insight, we meet Nathan Wanzara, a seasoned dealer in adhesive cement. Buildings collapsing due to usage of substandard construction materials is not new to many Ugandans. Besides steel, a major ingredient in construction is cement, and today on the market it comes in all sheds and brands. True also is the much presence of adulterated or substandard cement in the same market, posing a huge risk to massive developments currently going on in the country and the region. I'll, I'll be honest with you, there is, there is too much in terms of construction going on. Um, the standard gauge railway, um, lots of construction going around East Africa. And uh, we, we see a substantive amount of billions of shillings going into these projects. So are we going to invest these monies in short-term developments or are we looking at using quality products and then end up with zero maintenance as opposed to high costs of maintenance? So that is the niche. The huge construction funds aside, given the many lives at stake, in case of a construction mishap, it is critical that attention is paid to the quality of specific construction items needed for specific purposes. For cement, experts contend that it is not a one-size-fits-all arrangement. There are different types for different purposes. Water retention, because the biggest problem we are having in the country, or rather in the, in, in, the, in the construction industry, is the bit of leakages. Leakages everywhere, we, well, many products are in the market. They have worked, yes, but we want something to work a little longer. We want something to offer us that that, that, that advantage and, and kick out the bit of running costs in every, after, uh, in every other year. The products have worked, but yet we need a little more time on that. We need, we need to have longer periods of, of time without having to repair. Take for instance someone who wants to build in a waterlogged area or an area prone to flooding. Players in the industry say that to achieve project longevity, specific type of cement, like adhesive multipurpose cement as opposed to normal cement, can make a huge difference. The adhesive waterproof cement, first of all, I would want to explain to Ugandans that um, the difference it has is that um, anything you're going to use it for tiling, you're not going to see water seeping through your tile to affect your wall on the other side. So it's 50 years we're talking about of zero maintenance. So we're looking at the long term. What, what kind of structures are we building? Are they buildings that are going to stand the test of time or buildings that are just going to collapse on us? You can add half a bag, that is 12.5 kilos, to one bag of cement, the mixture, and it will give you the best result still. You can also add a bag to two bags and its mixture to give you a much wider space of operation. It has cut on your costs, first of all, and it has also given you a super bond. Yeah? So uh, depending on what someone wants. Today on the market, there are several types of adhesive cement, mainly used for specific jobs like plumbing and tiling. 
true though is that even among these brands, some perform better than others in different purposes and your structure engineer can help you choose what is best for you. Based on studies, starting a home-based bakery will cost you from between 500,000 and 1.5 million Ugandan shillings. But if that becomes your determination, there's a few more things required to realize this business. This week on Your Money, we examine the possibilities of running a profitable bakery, perhaps in your home. Today we are engaging on how you can establish a home-based bakery. It cannot and should not be accidental. You don't need millions of shillings. If you are starting from Sigiri, you just have to go and buy Sigiri, which costs you about maybe six to 70,000 shillings. You see that you need some saucepans, you need a weighing scale, which weighing scale is in the range of 100,000. Then you need basic elements like uh, the spoons, you need a tray, that tray which is also locally fabricated in Katwe, where you put your bread as you are putting in the oven. So at a basic level, about 500,000, you are ready to start business, if you are starting with Sigiri. But if you are moving a step higher, for example, you want to put a simple structure like that, you may look at about a million shillings, because you have to get some clay, you have to get a bit of cement, wire mess, and then you put a structure. After you have put a structure, then you look at the basic things I talked about. You need this sugar to help you. Even also to separate wheat, because it is already hard, there are some crumbs inside to make it clean for, for people who are buying your bread to enjoy it. You need a sofria. We are back in the village there in Madu. You need a sofria, which is going to help you. When you are preparing your feet, you just prepare it inside for here. After this one, you need a knife to help you to cut in order to balance the weight, the weight of, the, of, of, of the dough. You need, uh, this, is, uh, this is sugar. You need sugar. You need salt. This is salt. And you need yeast. This is yeast. So far, and you need water. Then you must have some product math, which has been done for you. And you can only improve it based on your environment. For you to make a half kilogram, more 500 grams of bread, you are going to spend about 1,800 to 2,000 shillings. But then you can sell it at 2,500, between 2,500 and 3,000 shillings. That is your cost rate. If you want to make buns like this, from one kilogram of wheat, you are likely to make 15 pieces of buns, and each goes for about 300 shillings. That is 4,500. But your cost element in making bun is between 3,000 to 3,200. If you use the right mixture, you weigh it well, you are likely to make 600 to 700 shillings per kilogram of wheat flour that you buy. But you need still to sit down and see the bread I'm going to make is purposely for what type of people. Now for us we came up, I and Julia, so we came up with this bread for diabetic people. They need sugar still, though they are suffering from diabetic, they are diabetic, but they still need sugar inside. But for us we are using buns. Why are we more on buns? Because not many people can accommodate this bread. It starts with 2,000 shillings. And with a bun, it is a 300, 200, 100, 500. So that one is accommodative. Uganda Investment Authority carries out specific skills training in home-based bakeries and such things as soap making for groups free of charge, based in their SMA division. This week on The Entrepreneur, Charles Muhindo, a computer engineer by profession, took advantage of what he learned in school and his short stint in employment to launch an application, BrainShare, which seeks to transform the education system in the country and the continent. His beginning was not the usual one, where one finishes school and goes out in search for employment. Charles Mohindo is among the lucky few who was handpicked by a corporate organization, and it's during his internship that he got a platform to actualize his skills and get his up brain share up and running. Orange ran a competition and was trying to find 
local talent that is doing something for the community and I won at the same competition then I was rewarded a, a clear shot to take um, you know um, an internship place there so during the time um, this is when I really got to know about business and how I could use what I've developed to you know to make really business sense orange asked that I put this service on their network so that their customers could benefit out of it all right so when I put it on the network customers started paying and it's the airtime that was being billed so at the end of the month we would reconcile you know, we'd find out how much airtime the customers spent on brain share, and that money would be paid to me. Lately, there are a number of people going into creation of applications to serve a multitude of purposes. Charles Mohindo's app, however, is obviously one that was well thought out, as he saw a big gap in the education system in the country and went out to fill this gap. Brain share is an e-learning platform um, that enables students to be connected directly to teachers, and um, personally. If I can say the inspiration around that is um, just like in Uganda, the way it is today, there are lots of kids who are very bright, but the only problem is uh, information dissemination is the problem. If you got a kid from, say, Nakapiripirit and gave them an opportunity to study at King's College Budo, you'll be shocked at how sharp they are. How then does Brainshare address these problems? A kid who studies in one school can be able to subscribe to the content in other schools. I'll explain this. I could be maybe in Tari school in Barara, but I know that Namagunga has the best chemistry teacher and Gayaza has the best physics teacher. So what I do in my platform, I can be able to subscribe to the math guy at Namagunga and I can subscribe to maybe the chemistry from Namagunga. So in other words, I'm in one school, but I have a bit of you know, content from the different schools. As far as visions and aspirations go, Mohindo has managed to expand and his brain share application has a footprint in African countries like Rwanda, Tanzania and Ghana, which then raises the question of how he managed to make it work in terms of finances. When it comes to technology, especially this uh, software business, it's about what is in here. It's not really about how much, because we don't need really space, we don't need a lot of machinery. I had a laptop and all I needed was pay for a server or pay for registration of the company, things like that, and then motivate a few friends who later joined me. Yeah, so I would say um, roughly maybe even three million. The state of the education system in the country is without a doubt one that needs intervention. So with the brain share up out to solve some of these hardships, Mohindo has encountered his fair share of challenges while dealing with some of the schools. Uh, some schools uh, have poorly stocked libraries. You know that for you to harness brain share well and use it well, it starts by the school having some you know, operational computers. Uh, maybe the, the school needs a one -time, an ability to have a one-time internet connect. Voted among the top 10 startups in Africa, Charles Mohindo is definitely doing something right with his brain share app. What started out as a solo project now employs 8 permanent staff and 15 contract workers. His is a testimony that with drive, determination and a solid business idea, it's possible. We now take a look at the latest in the financial markets. That's it this week on Money Matters. Thank you for your time. My name is Malcolm Sime. In case you want to get back to us, send us a text on 6565. You could also look for NTV Money Matters on Facebook. Leave your comments and views. Otherwise, enjoy your viewing for the rest of the programs.